In this video, we're going back to 1975. Written by Peter Benchley and Carl Gottlieb. Number 63 on the WGA's list of the 101 greatest screenplays. Here are eight screenwriting secrets in Jaws. Screenwriters are always told about the importance of the first 10 pages of their screenplay. In these first 10 pages, the reader must know what the story is about, who it's about, and what the major conflict is. And since one page of a screenplay generally equals one minute of actual screen time, look at how we learn everything we need in the first 10 minutes of Jaws. An unseen menace moves to the water. A young woman is attacked and massacred by this creature. Now we're fully aware of the genre of this movie. We're introduced to the hero, Martin Brody, and learn that he and Ellen aren't from Amity Island. When the oldest son, Michael, walks in with a cut hand, we learn that Brody is concerned with safety. We discover that Brody is the chief of Amity Police. The story world is established with the billboard displaying the 50th Regatta on July 4th. We see the Islanders' exclusivity. The hero gives us a glimpse of his fear of the water. We see that our hero doesn't deal a lot with serious matters. We discover the true reason for the woman's death. And finally, we learn that Amity has never had this problem before. Just like the shark, the story is lean and efficient. All of this is established before the 10 minute mark of the movie. Jaws does a brilliant job of having the character's actions dictated by their fears. Let's look at our hero, Martin Brody. He has a fear of the water. We know all about you, Chief. You don't go in the water at all, do you? Martin hates boats. Martin sits in his car when we go on the ferry to the mainland. Yeah, but I'm not drunk enough to go out on a boat. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. You can't do that. Yes, you can. Further out! What? Further out! Why? Go further out! What for? But all this seems to stem from a deeper fear, something from the past. This is evident in the way he's obsessed with safety. Those swings are dangerous. Stay off there. I haven't yeah. fixed them yet. Don't use the fireplace in the den because I haven't fixed them yet. But I'm responsible for public safety. Then go out there tomorrow and see that no one gets hurt. How many guys are going to put aboard that boat? Whatever's safe, right? Yeah, that ain't safe. And when is our hero hit the hardest emotionally? When he fails at keeping others safe. You knew there was a shark out there. But you let people go swimming anyway. Give us a kiss. Why? Because I need it. We also see prominent fears in the other characters. Quint reveals his during his tale of the USS Indianapolis. That was the time I was most frightened, waiting for my turn. I'll never put on a life jacket again. This explains his fiery obsession to hunt and kill sharks and to catch this one at all costs. I break the instrument, Terry! Mayor Larry Vaughn is terrified of losing the valuable tourist dollars. We're made aware of the town's fragile economy that depends on them. Amity is a summer town. We need summer dollars. Look, we depend on the summer people here for our very lives. You are not going and to have a summer those unless you're we're finished. Just I don't think one of you, one of one of you, one of you are, are familiar with our problems. Uh, what? 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 What are you talking about? Larry, the summer is over. So we understand why he's compelled to keep the beaches open, despite the clear danger of shark attacks. One of the outstanding things about this story is the rising stakes. Essentially, we have a shark preying on people on Amity Island. The stakes of death are already pretty huge to begin with, but look at how the stakes rise throughout the story based on the people. The first victim is a young woman from the campfire. We don't know anything about her except her name is Chrissy. Next, we have Boy Scouts doing a mile swim. Now that children are involved, the stakes are a little more significant. But again, we don't know any of the boys. Then we get Alex Kintner. This time, we get to know this character a little bit through his interactions with his mother. This causes the audience to emotionally invest themselves in the character. Then comes the big kahuna, the 4th of July. Not only do we have a massive wave of incoming tourists, the stakes start involving people we know. Michael's in the pond. He's dead. No, he's not. He's in shock. Why? My kids were on that beach too. And finally, the stakes involve the character we care about most, 
the hero. Fasten your safety belt. <laughs> if you see a shark, Hooper, swallow. <laughs> and the stakes are raised to the highest point when Martin Brody is left alone to fight the shark. He's forced to confront his fear of the water as the boat sinks. Start your stakes off high and make them even higher as the story progresses. If you'd like to see more on this film and others I've covered, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash scriptsleuth. You get access to special content not available to the public and become a vital part in growing the channel. In the last 50 minutes of the movie, the story narrows down to three characters, Quint, Brody, and Hooper. The three of them share the same goal, catching the shark. But instead of having them blend into a single group, look at how there's a brilliant contrast in the characters, with Quint and Hooper being at opposite ends of the spectrum and Brody falling right in the middle. Quint is the brawny warrior archetype. He's the perfect man to catch and kill the shark. Hooper is a trickster archetype, always cracking jokes. And Brody, of course, is the hero. Quint is the oldest, Hooper is the youngest, and Brody falls right in the middle. Quint is blue collar, Hooper is wealthy, and Brody is middle class. Quint uses old school equipment. Hooper uses modern technology. Brody just brings a revolver. Quint is an islander, Hooper is an outsider, and Brody is an outsider that now lives on the island. Again, falling right in the middle. See the brilliant way they provide a contrast in characters? There are a few examples of snappy, clever dialogue in this film. The characters don't address a question or statement about them. They create conflict with a comeback. You don't go in the water at all, do you? Some bad hat, Harry. Doesn't make any sense. I mean, they pay a guy like you to watch sharks? Doesn't make much sense for a guy who hates the water to live on an island, either. That doesn't prove a damn thing. Well, it proves one thing, Mr. Hooper. It proves that you wealthy college boys don't have the education enough to admit when you're wrong. It may not appear to be of much significance, but this kind of dialogue goes a long way in maintaining the tension in a scene and keeping the audience engaged. In a movie like Jaws, it's obvious that the biggest antagonist is the shark itself. But there's another brilliant source of resistance in this story, society. First, we have the Islander's click mentality. I go to Trinity. My folks live in Greenwich. The folks were born here, right? Yeah, I'm an Islander. When do I get to become an Islander? Ellen, never, never. You're not born here, you're not an Islander. Can you tell me if there's a good restaurant or hotel on the island? Uh, you walk straight ahead. <laughs> These are your people. Go and talk to them. Those aren't my people. They're from all over the place. Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Jersey. When do we get them silly bastards down in that rock pile and they start taking their bottoms out and slamming into them rocks, boy? Which makes this line especially ironic. Amity, as you know, means friendship. The residents bombard Martin with trivial matters as he tries to do his job. Now, we got a bunch of calls about that karate school. It's... There's a damn truck with a hamster face on it smack in front of my store. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. This to my kids, my eight and nine year old. Hey, Mike, I know you got a lot of problems downtown, but I've got a couple of problems at the house I wish you could take care of. Brody, sick vandalism. Now, I want those little paint happy bastards caught and hung up by their Buster Brown. And finally, Chief Brody gets resistance when he tries to keep the people safe. Martin, you, you gonna shut down the beaches on your own authority? Now, technically, you need a civic ordinance or a resolution by a board of select. That's just going by the book. Are you going to close the beaches? Yes, we are. Oh, oh, for Christ's sake, tomorrow's the 4th of July, and we will be open for business. It's gonna be one of the best summers we've ever had. A common piece of advice given to writers is write what you know. But if you have no personal experience with great white sharks, can you write a story like Jaws? Peter Benchley did. Although he had spent some time fishing in Nantucket, he still had to do research to find the details. So the more apt phrase might be, know what you write. Look at how the specific details make this story feel authentic. Don't race sail, you're just gonna love it. You got a paddle on the boat? Uh, so skull out of here. Non-frenzy feeding of a large squalus, possibly 
Angemanis or Asurus Glaucus. Probably just a school of mackerel or something all flung together. Just tie me a sheep shank. Hey, robot, he's flies M1, really clip, handy, Billy, fly it, man. All of our injectors got scored from the salt water in the fuel. Tiger, 13 footer, you know, you know that when you're in the water, Chief? You tell by looking from the dorsal to the tail. As I sat down to analyze this film, I thought, how am I going to talk about the last 50 minutes of the movie when all they do is fight the shark? And as I broke down the scenes, it hit me. The final act in this movie is all about sequences. Sequences are composed of several scenes unified in a single dramatic idea. Think of them as mini-stories in themselves. So in the final act, the three men have one goal, kill the shark. But look at how there are multiple, smaller objectives broken down into the following sequences. Keep that chum line going, Chief. We got five good miles on him. Get behind me. Hoover! Reverse her! Attach the end of this line to the first keg. Gotta get a good shot at that porker's head. What do we do now? We win, right? We've got one barrel on him, so we stay out here till we find him again. Out of the hey, Chief! Olaf, run it! I think he's right under the keg. Grab the boat hook. When he runs, you drop that rope or you'll lose your hands. Hook me up another barrel! Oh, Bravo! Get me right up alongside him! Gentlemen, snag him. Untie us! You pull out the transom! It's impossible! The line is too tight! Draw him in, the shallow water gonna draw him in and drown him. Well, I think I can pump 20 cc's of strychnine nitrate into him if I can get close enough. So what are your thoughts? Anything you'd like to add? Let us know by leaving a comment below. And if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe for upcoming videos from Script Sleuth. Thank you so much for watching.